Hello everyone. Recently, the power adapter, also the charger for my laptop, burned out. I bought the laptop secondhand, and it didn't come with the original adapter. Instead, there was this one, a universal adapter. It worked for quite a long time, but one fine day, there was a burning smell, it overheated, and it refused to turn on. This is, not cheap mass-produced goods. Considering that it's serious, quite powerful, and provides several voltages, the cost of a new one would be significant. I needed to quickly repair it because I need the laptop. Part of my videos are edited on it. But still, I decided to shoot a video explaining the working principle, diagnostics, and repair, and in the meantime, the laptop will be powered by a weak adapter. I hope it can hold out for a few days while I shoot the video. So, about the adapter. It's universal, provides several voltages, and the plug can be changed to power different laptops. The voltage is set by a switch that is installed on the power cord. In this dial, there are resistive dividers that set the output voltage. Personally, I think it would be better if the switch were located in the body of the adapter itself. In that case, it would be possible to get rid of the long wires that stretch from this thing to the power supply unit. But the wires here are shielded to minimize the influence of various interferences. Considering the stated specifications, maximum output current, and voltage, it becomes clear that the source is 120 watts. Not bad. It opens by unscrewing four self-tapping screws. Inside, we find a board, the components of which are almost completely covered by a couple of heat sinks. The large heat sink cools almost everything, including a pair of power switches, a diode assembly, a bridge, as well as the power transformer and the power factor correction choke. Yes, this source is equipped with an active power factor corrector. This is, of course, a huge plus, but it complicates the design. And the cost of sources with active PFC is much higher than that of regular ones. The second heat sink is needed to cool the output rectifier. And anyone who has repaired or designed switching power supplies, any of them, will say that the output rectifier heats up the most. So why is the heat sink for it so small? The fact is that this power supply unit uses the method of synchronous rectification, and instead of diodes, field effect transistors are used, which have very low on-state resistance, and heat up very, slightly. I think that soon synchronous rectifiers in power circuits will completely replace regular diodes. Other heat-prone components, such as the transformer and the PFC choke, are pressed against a large heat sink through thermal paste or thermal pads. The heat sink itself is also pressed against the plastic case of the adapter through a thermal pad. The designers were well aware that in a closed case, all of this needs to be considered, and cooling should be maximized. By removing these heat sinks, we can see the internals. All the power components are on top, while all the control components in the form of surface mount technology are on the reverse side of the board. It should be noted that the board is single-sided, everything necessary is secured with sealant for reliability. First, let's understand how such units are structured and how they work. The provided schematic is purely demonstrative. Initially, the AC mains voltage passes through a fuse, which in this case is compact, rated at 3.15 amperes, a thermistor, and a line filter, and then reaches the input rectifier. Additionally, a varistor protection is installed at the input after the fuse. A varistor is a device that protects the source if there is a voltage spike in the network. At a certain voltage, it will simply open, shorting the network. In the circuit, the weakest link will be the fuse, which will simply blow, preventing voltage from reaching the circuit. The thermistor, on the other hand, reduces current surges when the source is connected to the network. It should be noted that a rather serious network filter and a powerful input bridge are used here. It is rated for 6 amps, 600 volts. The rectified voltage then goes to the active power factor corrector. The corrector, you could say, is a separate power source. It has its own PWM controller, a power transistor with a diode, and an inductor. By the way, here it is. After the corrector, the power goes to the converter circuit itself. The topology is classic for similar sources. 
a single-ended flyback converter based on a current mode PWM controller. We have one high voltage MOSFET that drives the power transformer. Yes, I know, technically it's not a transformer, but an inductor. The power MOSFET is controlled by the PWM controller. It also handles protection and feedback. There is a self bias winding on the transformer. The initial power to start the circuit is provided by a current limiting resistor. After startup, the PWM controller will be powered by the previously mentioned winding. In the output section of the circuit, an LM393 comparator is installed. Look, this tiny thing is a current transformer in the secondary circuit. It has a primary winding, one turn with a flat bus, and a secondary winding. The voltage from the secondary winding is monitored by the comparator. If there is excessive consumption or a short circuit at the output, the voltage on the secondary winding of this transformer will increase. This leads to a large voltage drop across the current sensor. The comparator will compare this voltage with the reference voltage. If it detects an issue, then through the feedback line, built on a standard 817 optocoupler, it will send a command to the PWM to take action. With the use of such a system, you can organize both current protection so that in case of an issue the output voltage of the source disappears and current stabilization. The latter is not quite correct. This is when in case of problems the unit does not shut down, but goes into a limiting mode, delivering maximum current at the output. This can completely destroy an already burnt out laptop. The second optocoupler is used to build the feedback, voltage feedback or stabilization. The voltage is set by this small chip, TL431. It is a controllable Zener diode or reference voltage source, and the output voltage can be adjusted by selecting two resistors. In the circuitry of this chip, there is current protection and primary circuit protection. Here, the current sensor are low ohm SMD resistors connected. In the source circuit of the high voltage MOSFET, the output part of the power supply is also classic, except for the synchronous rectifier. Two powerful N channel MOSFETs, which have their own control system, it is hidden under a sealant. Despite the fact that powerful MOSFETs SSF7509 are used here, which have a resistance of the open channel is 6.5 milliohms and a dissipated power of 200 watts, the manufacturer added a second identical key in parallel. Well, that's very commendable. Regarding the synchronous rectifier, the MOSFETs can be controlled by a simple circuit or even by an additional winding, as well as specialized ICs that monitor the transformer's output, opening and closing the switch at the right time. The only thing that bothers me in this part of the circuit is the use of 25 volt capacitors. On the output, considering that this unit can output a voltage of 24 volts, that's clearly not enough. There's practically no margin at all. The total capacitance of the capacitors is 2000 microfarads. That might be a bit low, but it all depends on the operating frequency of the circuit. The power transformer is very well made, featuring a brass strip on the core. This is most likely done for even an intensive heat dissipation across the entire surface of the core and transferring it to the heatsink, or perhaps for shielding, although usually the windings are shielded. Speaking of the windings, the secondary is well made, wound with lit's wire. Without a doubt, six amps can be drawn from it. It's time to start the repair. This is the burnt area. It burned for quite a while, even the fiberglass burned through, the solder melted, and as a result, the smell of burnt fiberglass, which lingers for days. But diagnostics need to be done in order. Set the multimeter to continuity and first check the fuse with the thermistor and varistor. Everything seems fine. It wouldn't hurt to also check the input rectifier in the form of a ready-made diode bridge. In our case, it is also functional. Then I checked the output of the source and found that there is a short circuit. But there's no doubt about it. The problem is with the rectifier. Capacitors can also fail, but in this case, there are no visible damages. Then I checked the MOSFETs. And yes, they are shorted, possibly, only, one of them, since, they are not connected in parallel. So we dold or both. Make sure the short circuit is gone. We check the transistors, and see that one of them is completely dead. 
In fact, it is shorted in such a way that the transistor tester goes into calibration mode. With the second transistor, everything is fine. They can burn out on their own due to overheating, for example, but sometimes their control or something else is to blame. The gates of these transistors are connected in parallel, but not directly, through resistors. Of 10 ohms, it's necessary to check them for integrity. Everything is fine. Let's move on. Next, we should test the Zener diodes that protect the transistor gates from overvoltage and the low power diodes, which can also be in the gate circuits. Once confirmed that there are no short circuits, let's move on. I scraped off the sealant from the control circuit with the synchronous rectifier. No shorts were found. All that's left is to test it in operation. We need to replace the SSF7509 MOSFETs with something. They're scarce in our area. Fortunately, I have RF2907 transistors. They are rated for 75 volts with a power dissipation of 300 watts. The drain current is 160 amps and the on state resistance is as low as 4.5 milliohms. So, in comparison, they are much better than those that were originally installed by the manufacturer. First, using thermal pads and plastic bushings, we attach the transistors to the heatsinks and then solder them onto the board. After this procedure, all that's left is to trim off the excess, and basically, that's it. Next, we move on to the high voltage section. First, I tested the 11 and 80 transistor, 11 amps, 800 volts, which is part of the inverter circuit and controls the transformer. And it seems to be intact. Then I checked the dual diode rated for 10 amps and 400 volts, and the 11 amp MOSFET in the power factor correction circuit. Surprisingly, they are also fine. For now, I don't see any problems in the high voltage circuit, except for this spot, so I do older and check the diode in the snubber circuit. After removal, it turned out to be a unidirectional protective diode P6KE250 with a breakdown voltage of about 240 to 250 volts. I suspect that it was triggered multiple times and eventually what happened, happened. It's not quite enough for our network. Unfortunately, I couldn't quickly find a similar one, but I've already ordered it, though with a breakdown voltage of 350 volts. In the meantime, we'll test without it. Before soldering in the new diode, we clean the burnt area to the clean fiberglass. After installing the diode, we cover this area with varnish. All that's left is to connect the power source to the network, but not directly. Instead, through a safety incandescent lamp rated at 2040 watts. The multimeter records the output voltage. By turning the switch, we ensure that the source gives out all the voltages. Problems. Next, we need to attach the heat sinks. Not forgetting about the thermal paste and thermal pads with washers. All that's left is to test the source under load. I have an electronic load. The four wire measurement option is used to compensate for losses in the power wires. We increase the load current to 5 amps, and as we can see, everything is great. The power at the output of the source is about 120 watts. Some might say, made a whole video just to show how I replaced a couple of MOSFETs and a diode. But I hope there won't be many such comments, because the goal of this video is to familiarize you with the designs of such sources to explain and tell you which component is responsible for what regarding the repair of more simple sources of this type. That's basically it. All useful links, as always, are in the description. Thank you all for your attention. And as always, this was Kazyanov K with you. Until next time, bye.